Okay, so uh, we've been going over the topic of particle filtering. And uh, many of these issues are best illustrated with, with slides here. So I, I think I'll remind us that uh, while much of the course we were pursuing topics in parameter inference, we're asking what is data from the world when examined together with a model telling us about the values of parameters. Uh, for recent lectures, we've been dealing squarely with this issue of filtering, inferring the latent state of a stochastic system, which is a different problem than inferring, inferring its parameter values. For even fixed parameter values, the stochastic system will have variability. And therefore, we won't be able to, from fixed values of parameters, firmly know what the underlying situation, the latent state is of the system right now, even given model assumptions. But of course, we have something much more than that. We have incoming data. And between model assumptions and incoming data, we're getting information about what's actually playing out in terms of the underlying situation, what's actually being realized in terms of the stochastics. I've given you the example that it's it will be really hard for you to go from your home to your workplace with your eyes closed. Um, even with the best of mental models, you have to open your eyes along the way. And each time you do open your eyes, it clues you into where you are and you get a better sense of where you are. But then when you close them again, further you go on, the more and more uncertain you are. And uh, when we deal with empirical data from the world, it's a little bit like that, except Typically, it's not like opening our eyes when it's wide, you know, when it's bright daylight outside. It's like opening our eyes in, in the middle of a snowstorm or a bit of fog uh, and or if it's, you know, late evening. We, do, we can't tell exactly where we are, but we kind of get a clue and we combine that with our mental model, um, which rules out certain interpretations to get a consensus interpretation of where we are. We're not tossing our mental model out altogether, far from it. Our mental model gives us an interpretation of roughly where we are that then allows us to piece together the evidence that we get from the world to, to firmly establish, oh, th this is the intersection we're approaching or, or this is the, the crosswalk that's right in front of us or what have you. And, and particle filtering is a particularly powerful way of of, of pursuing this. Um, uh, particle filtering moves beyond the sort of limitations of calibration and, and, um, and calibrating parameters to arrive at models that be frequently regrounded and it moves beyond open loop models to models that are, that are constantly updated with new data. And we saw all this. Uh, and uh, in that sense, it's kind of like having a weather model where it's constantly updated by new data. And importantly, getting this understanding of where we're at right now, what the current situation is, just like when walking to your office or just like um, uh, an epidemiological uh, decision, you know, public health decision-making, understanding where we're at often gives us a big clue as to what course of action going forward is most desirable. If we're in a situation where there are very few susceptibles, a mass vaccination campaign might have a uh, limited impact in the short term. By contrast, if we have uh, quite a few susceptibles still and only a modest number of, of uh, actual infectives, uh, maybe an outbreak response immunization campaign would make sense. If there's many, if our latent state of our system revealed by particle filtering suggests there's many undiagnosed individuals out there in the population, that might clue us in to the desirability of uh, large scale active case finding, drive through, back, drive through testing and, and efforts to do, um, to do uh, larger efforts at contact tracing, et cetera, in order to identify these undiagnosed infectives. Um, in short, understanding where we are is often 
very important for deciding what to do. It's also very important for understanding where things are going in the near future, projecting it forward. Uh, pinning down our current context is very valuable for understanding where things are going and what we can do about it. Um, and we have talked earlier about Kalman filtering as an approach for doing this with uh, linearization and, and Gaussian assumptions about distributions and particle filtering in a way that, that loosens those assumptions. And I had noted to you from this seat during our last meeting that particle filtering can be interpreted at four or five different levels. Um, one can convey some understanding of particle filtering at, with different levels of metaphors or, or different levels of formalism. At the very highest level, I've appealed to issues like this, weather maps and GPS systems and, and this analogy of opening your eyes as you're walking to the office. That's the metaphorical level, the very top level which clues us into our fact that when we're dealing with the world, models left to themselves are myth. Data left to itself is madness. And you have to bring them together to move beyond myth and madness. Um, uh, we have to have theory of some sort as captured by a model to lend an understanding of what is data telling us. And yet theory disconnected from the world, blindfolded as it were, could end us up tripping over a curb or getting hit by a car because we cross the street when, when we don't have a, 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 the walk sign illuminated. Um, we, we need data to clue us in. Even the best model can't anticipate which way stochastics will go or the arrival of unexpected occurrences, you know, the arrival of a new variant or changes of behavior or, or you know, misstatements by political leaders or what have you. Um, we need models that are kept regrounded, kept informed, kept abreast of the latest developments much as we do for weather models. That's the metaphorical level. Um, and you can get a certain amount of, of traction out of that level. But I tried to clue you in, make sure that everyone here is included in some intuition that goes beyond mere metaphor. This is intuition that involves reasoning about what's going on in particle filtering in terms of a, of a kind of survival of the fittest between different hypotheses, where we have an underlying system evolving according to some stochastic differential equations. Ordinary differential equations are shown here, but, but we, we embellish them with some stochastics. And where we have a set of competing hypotheses, at the least hundreds of them, commonly thousands of them, frequently we need tens of thousands, and for larger models such as this one, we'll commonly use hundreds of thousands of them. And each of these hypotheses is a sample. It samples from possible system state. Each of these hypotheses at a certain time posits a certain number of people in each of these boxes, each of these stocks, each of these states. It posits a certain number of susceptibles, a certain number of exposed, a certain number of infected, uh, pre-symptomatic infectives, certain number of persistently asymptomatic infectives early and late in their stage, et cetera. A given particle, a given sample, a given hypothesis about the situation right now will have a complete state vector associated with it. And uh, those different hypotheses will have different, although different hypotheses about what's going on here. Some will think they're more susceptible. Some will think they're, they're fewer and more infective. Some will think most people are recovered, what have you. And they're all jousting. They're all competing to, com to explain the situation and, and particularly to, um, to try to best explain the data, the, the observations from the world. 
they're trying to trying to best account for the data, match the data, um, and and those particles that are are more consistent with that flourish and are multiplied. They get big weights, and then in the resampling process, they proliferate. Uh, well, those which posit things inconsistent with the data that are con that are um, on an ongoing basis at variance with the data, that they're not consistent with what we see from the world. They posit things that are flat, implausible, given what we see in the world. Those will tend to die out. So there's this survival of the fittest, particles that are, are more fit, are fruitful and multiply, those that are less fit eke out uh, survival, and those that are, are very poorly fit die out. And so it is, and we run the model on. So we could think of our model here as kind of consisting of layers, each associated with a particle, and each associated with a weight. We never consider particles except for their weights. If we want to ask what do particles believe, we always have to draw from them according to their weights by the principle of importance sampling, which I hope to get to uh, during our next and final lecture on particle filtering. But when we're so doing, um, uh, each of these particles weights gets updated when an observation comes in to reflect its the degree to which it accounted for that data, to reflect its ongoing credibility. Uh, so, so here we have another level of, of metaphor, or sorry, level number, not another level of, of intuition and understanding. And that, in, that intuition is very understanding, is, is very useful. But I started to, to talk about some additional features of this last time that are, are very important. Commonly, we need to incorporate uncertainty into our model, not only with stochastic evolution of, with respect to the differentials, the flow between those stocks, between those state variables, but commonly with respect to the parameter values as well. And here we'll often have several parameter values that either directly or in transformed versions of themselves undergo random walks. And although this seemed counterintuitive, it reflects the fact that we are trying to have different hypotheses about what's going on. Some hypotheses might involve larger numbers of contacts per day. Others might posit smaller numbers, yet others might, might say, okay, uh, active testing is really good at finding people, while others um, view it as, as, as not very efficacious, that most people are walking in with symptoms themselves or what have you. Uh, we might have the reporting rate be something which is, um, has, is an element of uncertainty, and we account for that by having a parameter associated with a random walk. And the model will infer by selecting particles that are more consistent with the data, it will infer by extension values of these parameters. So, so part of the art of what's going on here is that we're introducing uncertainty and we are using that uncertainty to help us interpret data from the world. And we're using and we're inferring the best understanding of, of parameter values that we don't know that are evolving over time using what's known from the world and the model. Uh, and a key component of this was our, of, of, of ha having this whole thing hang together was our use of likelihood functions. I noted that in terms of intuition, these particles have their weights up-weighted or down-weighted based on their degree of consistency, the degree to which they predict things that are consistent with observed data. And the way that's operationalized is with the likelihood function. Um, every time we get a new observation, we ask for each and every particle. What 
for you would be the likelihood of observing this data. And if that likelihood is very high, that particle's weight grows. How? By multiplying it by that likelihood. Um, so each particle has some prediction. There's some actual observations from the world. And uh, we compute the likelihood of making those observations given the particle state, given what the particle would have expected. And uh, we end up multiplying the, the weight of the particle by the likelihood. And often we have multiple likelihoods. And the common way to deal with this uh, that we've used to very good effect and others have used is by multiplying likelihoods. So if you have a likelihood for cases, another one for viral concentrations in wastewater, another one for uh, ICU admissions, uh, each particle has some likelihood computed of seeing the empirical data in light of what it thinks should occur. We have a likelihood for each of those. So we multiply together to get a composite likelihood, multiply the particle's weight by that. And we do that for all the particles and then we renormalize the weights. The weights are normalized to sum to one. And that reflects now a situation where the particles that have been, have been most consistent with the data that had high likelihood values tend to have weights that have grown relative to the other ones. If a particle, by contrast, had very poor consistency, it expected almost no cases, but in fact, there were many, or it expected a minuscule number of people in the hospital, but there were lots, then its likelihood values would be very small. We multiply them by its weight, the weight becomes even smaller. And when we normalize weights, that weight will tend to go down relative to the other ones. And then we're going to resample in this judgment day, there'll be a sort of accounting for the particles and the low weight ones will tend to die out and the high weight ones will multiply. And because this is a stochastic process, even though these are cloned, they will diverge over time because of the stochastics. Initially, they'll start at that same state and then they'll diverge. So, so that was kind of another level of, of understanding. We update our weights and then we perform resampling by a multinomial draw. We, each particle has a weight and that gives the probability we'll draw that particle. And when, when we do resampling, we draw a number of, we draw, from that distribution, that multinomial distribution, where each particle has a certain probability being drawn, we draw from it a, a number of draws equal to the number of particles. It tells us what particles will survive um, after resampling and how many times by implication. And then we'll use those as our new particles. Um, so uh, this is, this is a, another level of particles. Um, I want to I note that um, these particles are seeking to identify a, a coherent understanding for what's going on. They're trying to identify an explanation for this observed data that is consistent with the, the model. This model reflects our theory and all the particles are bound by the rules of the model. They evolve by, and they are governed by the rules of the model. They evolve according to the stochastic differential equations of the model. There's no particle that just goes off and has random thoughts about what the current state is. They, they, they have the regularities of the system. This model captures our, our best understanding of the regularities about, in this case, COVID-19 works. Maybe it's how measles works. Maybe it's how flu works. Maybe it's how, how rubella or how HIV AIDS work. But a model expresses our theory and it constrains our interpretation of what's going on, much as when we're walking to work, 
our mental model constrains our interpretation of where we could be. Um, we're working to work, we may be in a whiteout of a snowstorm, but when we open our eyes and we get a glimpse of this light or that store sign, we, we use our mental model to figure out what area of the city we're in. We're, we know we're not hopping randomly around the world or around the city. We, we have a certain sense of, of, of plausible possibilities. And that's what our model gives us. It gives us this sense of plausible possibilities. Um, we can't be anywhere in the world in terms of the state of the system. The, the state of the system has to evolve according to the orderly principles captured in the model, how COVID-19 infection progresses or how flu progresses or how measles progresses or what have you. Now, it's critical to, to recognize, though, that when we typically have a model, a simulation model, and we run it forward, um, we're asking what, is, what are the logical consequences of the parameters we plugged into the model and this model structure over time? That's what we're seeing from this model, running it forward normally, putting aside particle filtering. When, we're, when we have particle filtering, or for that matter, carbon filtering, what we're trying to do is infer as well, right? We're, we're going beyond just running a model. We're, inferring what is the case in the, mo in, in the world. Um, and, and this has big implications. Um, we're trying to, to infer from observed data in ways that square with model understanding. And um, I thought I had put in some additional comments here in this slide, but um, I'll, I'll just walk us through them. So. When I run a model that is um, that has certain parameter values normally outside of the particle filtering context, um, uh, you know this is something which um, uh, will run and, and give me some results. It's not being corrected in any way by observations, but in particle filtering and in common filtering. Recurrent observations, these observations from the world occurring on an ongoing basis are correcting my understanding. And I'm, I'm trying to understand uh, with, with those tools, common filtering, particle filtering, what are those telling me about this underlying situation? Now, uh, if I were to run that model with a different set of assumptions, let's suppose, um, I, I run it with a normal contact rate and in the particle filter, and I observe what it infers the state of the system is. Fine. Um, if I were to go and raise that contact rate, say double it for simplicity, that posited contact rate, let's suppose that were a fixed parameter in the model. For, for the sake of simplicity. If I were to double it and run it, if it's a fixed parameter and double it, the model is not, the particle filter model is not going to lead to just double the transmission or something like that, like a normal model would. Um, why? Because it's trying to make sense of the actual observed data from the world, the same observed data. And if I double the, the contact rate, um, the model's gonna be trying to, the particle filtering process is gonna be trying to figure out how does what's going on in the model square with what's observed in, in, in the world? It's not typically gonna be assuming, okay, transmission is all double of what it was. To account for the fact that you only see a certain number of new infections reported on a given day, for example, it may end up doubling the, the, the contact rate in, in this model during particle filtering may, may lead it to say, oh gosh, we're only seeing that many infections with this high contact rate, there must be very few susceptibles. Or it'll say, oh, people must be, you know, re recovering quickly, or, or th there must be m many people already, re uh, already recovered or what have you, uh, or many people not being reported. Um, 
in short, it's going to find other ways to infer the situation that square with this data from the world in the model assumptions. So this is very important to recognize. Just because we go and, you know, uh, normally when we run a model, you know, if we double the contact rate, we expect to see faster spread of infection and a higher attack rate and a a higher peak number of people infected. That won't be the case typically when we're particle filtering because what's going on there is also inferencing. It's inferring things about the rest of the system that are, that are not, uh, not directly observable. Uh, and it's squaring what it does see with the, the assumptions made for parameters and the model. Uh, and trying to make sense of it all. So there, if you double that, that parameter value associated with, uh, with contact rate, it's not going to lead to necessarily a much higher attack rate. It'll lead the model saying, well, to explain this data I see from the world, uh, I've got to find another way to explain it. If the contact rate is that high, I must have to assume you know, low value of this or this or this to, to, to account for the moderate value of, of, of the observed data. So particle filtering is an inference task. It, it goes beyond just simulation to be an inference task. It's inferring in ways that are consistent with the sim, what's, what, what's possible in simulation. It's just not, um, not doing so uh, in a way that's uncontrolled, that's open loop. It's doing it in a closed loop fashion where new data comes in and it corrects our understanding. So bear in mind the particle filter models are inference tools and you have to treat them as such. I have had collaborators who, who get really confused why when we run our particle filtering model, for example, with a alternative assumption about vaccination efficacy, the model, the particle filter model results um, don't follow exactly what they would expect for a simulation model. They're two separate, uh, separate um, processes going on there. Simulation, yes, but also the inference. Um, I also wanna note that in this whole process at a practical level, there's a key balance being struck. This too is a level of intuition with particle filtering. Um, uh, when we incorporate into our particle filter these uncertainties, these random walks associated with parameters or uncertainties associated with um, how many people are transmitted infection at a given time, say characterizing it in a Poisson distributed way, um, uh, this, these uncertainties serve uh, a very important purpose. I, I'd spoken before, they give the model humility, um, the particle filtering humility about interpreting the data. And you want a model that is not too overconfident and, not, and, and isn't so humble that it gives up all interpretation. I would said this before and I'll, I'll just reemphasize it. It's really, a lot of it comes in in those assignment of random walks to parameters. We don't want them to be so broad that the model just says, I have no clue about what's going on. Just like when you're walking in a snowstorm to your office from home, you don't wanna just say, I have no idea where in the world I am in my city. Um, you wanna have some degree of confidence uh, about where you are roughly so you can interpret things. At the same time, you don't want to be overconfident, be bullheaded about where you are um, and, and be off, off base. So here we're, we're, we're balancing these two. And one of the biggest ways we do this is by introducing the random walks. Another way is by broadening the likelihood functions through use of things like dispersion parameters, which basically allow us to be more accommodating, have our likelihood be larger, even if the values that we observe are further off. We saw that in the last example I showed you on Friday, where we had a dispersion parameter R 
for a negative binomial distribution and having a broader, have a, a smaller value of R gave a broader value of the likelihood. Um, so we want to avoid overconfidence and we want to avoid underconfidence. We want to have some degree of self-efficacy, believe in ourselves enough to, 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 to trust some key intuitions, but avoid just uh, a bullheaded believing hard that ends us up um, uh, with, with not being open to, to being corrected by data. Um, so this is how we tune things in our model. And, and a big thing we do is tune the values of those random walk parameters so that the random walk isn't occurring too quickly where it loses all confidence very quickly. Uh, that'll be like, as soon as you close your eyes walking to work, you, you know, within 30 seconds, you feel totally confused. You could be over by the airport, you could be downtown, you could be, you know, um, in, in the outskirts, in the suburbs. Um, you don't want that. You, you, you want something which is, um, which slowly accumulates uncertainty but doesn't lead you to just be paralyzed by uncertainty. Um, at the same time, you, you do want enough uncertainty so that those particles are open to those different possibilities. So these are the stochastics, uh, the issue of stochastics. It's a balancing act. And when models are infer are serve as inference tools, if they have very little uncertainty, um, they will, basically not seriously seriously consider uh, some of the some of the possibilities uh, which would otherwise be considered if they have a broadened sense. So a model that when it sees unexpected data is willing to change um, can sometimes be a, a good thing and it, it adjusts its understanding. So uh, when, for example, this model, uh, Shayan's model here, suddenly sees a rise here in number of cases beyond what it would have expected, it will try to accommodate that. If the, if the model had been too bullheaded, too sure of itself, it might have said, oh, I think, you know, the number of cases will just be declining here. Instead, it it changes its assumption about contact rate to allow it to, to follow this data. Um, by contrast, if the model is too uncertain, if it's just, just totally confused, it's totally blur, it'll just be knocked about and uncertain a little bit with like what happens out here. In, this is in the future when we project it forward, but out here it doesn't really know what's going to go on and it doesn't take a stake on any, any possibility. And in general, that's fine if you project it forward long enough. That'll be like you walking with your eyes closed for 45 minutes or an hour. You're more and more confused about where you are. That's, that's, that's not unreasonable but you don't want that to occur within 30 seconds or within a minute. You want you to have enough continuity of understanding and confidence that it lends you uh, some structure to your, to your understanding. Um, so this is um, a lot of the art of particle filtering. One final thing I'll say is, because I got a question on it uh, at one point with Kalman filtering, What's occurring here going from, from this period where we're observing data, that's the red data points. Each of them are correcting our understanding. We're, we're taking each of them, we're upweighting particles and downweighting particles, renormalizing and, and selecting from the particles and we get a different distribution, a posterior distribution out accordingly. What's going when we start to go into the future regime, when we start to predict forward, uh, where data points are shown but are not used to correct the model, they're just used to compare how does the model's expectation differ against what we see from the world. For this regime, it's like we're never getting new data um, considered by the particle filtering. 
it's always just running, 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 running forward. Um, all the particle weights stay the same. They're never corrected. They're never adjusted. They just remain the same. And each particle is projecting forward according to these, whoa, to these equations um, uh, in the natural way, to the stochastic differential equations. It's just plodding its way forward uh, with no corrections being involved. That's what's going on in these regimes. That's what's going on in these, in these future timeframes. And that's how we run particle filtering. When we have observations from the worlds, uh, we, we learn from it, uh, right? Um, we learn every time a new data point comes in, it sharpens our understanding of the current situation, of the values of these uncertain parameters. The, the ones that are varying over time. And then at some point we have no more data and we project forward, no corrections for particles. Each one runs independently going forward. Um, so that's another level. That's a third level down of, of understanding. Uh, are there any questions about those levels before I take us to the fourth level down in understanding? which is going to be more mathematical in nature. Yes, yeah. Maurice. Yeah, th thanks, Nate. Um, I, I was just typing a note into the chat, but uh, I'll say it instead. So uh, what I've understood is you've got, to, we've got, there are two kinds of parameters. There's uh, parameters that you could say are immutable. Um, yes. That would be, that static, would be like uh, parameters. As, you know, yeah. day, days per week or hours per day, that that doesn't really change. Um, and and then there are parameters that um, could be affected by conditions, environmental conditions like contact rates or uh, perhaps um, you know incubation time or, or recovery time, depending upon the variant in question at, uh, that's prevalent uh, at, at that particular time. Um, that, so that, that is right. If these are static. They're static parameters versus parameters that are basically part of system state and which by the way for both common filtering and particle filtering you treat as part of system state because you believe they're evolving notable ways over time and contact rate would be a prime example um recovery rate may or may not be that may be more biologic and you may view that as um you know as as more or less fixed as well but um, so, there's going to be anyway, some my, that are more or less static and some that are evolving. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I suppose my question is, you know, this, for the static parameters, which uh, don't evolve in the simulation, um, presumably they come from, uh, uh, you know, research or reliable sources or, or uh, uh, you know, uh, they are, uh, you know, we, we might, uh, early on in the pandemic for COVID-19, there, there was a, an attempt to use, um, you know, SARS as a uh, as, as a guide, and it didn't work out very well. Um, and and uh, you know, so you know, th there were some thought to be immutable parameters there that were were used as a as a benchmark. And then there, you know, we found out later that uh, well, actually, that wasn't a particularly good assumption. Um, so what do you do about in, in particle filtering about those what you think are static parameters, but they might not be. Yeah, so it's a good question. And, and I want to distinguish between um, not knowing about them versus are they evolving uh, a lot over time? Really, the question of does it belong here is, are they evolving plausibly over, uh, over time in really notable ways? Um, uh, and, um, and, and if so, if you want to track their evolution, then, then you, you treat them as part of latent state inference. If they're not, and they're merely uncertain, that you, you have uncertainty about them, um, there's the normal tricks you can use. And in fact, one of the things our group has done would be to calibrate your particle filtering model with respect to these parameters. So here we have a particle filtering model that is, you know, performs with different levels of, um, of acceptability as we change parameter values. 
and we can actually calibrate it um, and arrive at a best estimate of these missing parameter values. You can do so by hand, you can do so, we've done so in, in by hand or automated ways. Um, uh, as we're coming to, uh, particle MCMC will form some of our final lectures and, and that is going to uh, perform particle filtering with the parameter inference of, of static parameters as well. But calibration of those is, is reasonable. Um, uh, you know, the normal parameter estimation and sensitivity analysis uh, is not a bad idea, but uh, fundamentally static parameters are not, um, are not something that you're going to be pursuing estimating with, with particle filtering, yeah. Okay, thank you. It, in other words, it's particle filtering itself is not going to get you the right values for those parameters. Um, it, it, it could be, it, you have to pursue additional things with particle filtering to get you those values of the parameters, whether it's particle it. MCMC calibration or other things, yeah. Got it, yeah. okay. Yeah. Any other questions, comments? Okay, um, well, we, we, have, uh, we have half an hour, well, 40, 40 minutes left here. So I'm going to um, switch over to some mathematical treatment. Um, I have two, okay, so there's, there's um, two levels at which we could, uh, I can, further introduce you to um, the mathematics of particle filtering. One of them has to do with what we're computing, why this all hangs together probabilistically, why this works in terms of um, what, what distributions are being sampled. And there's a beautiful story there. Um, there's a lower level yet, which has to do with sequential importance sampling. It's how we sample, how we sample from those distributions. The what is what distributions we're sampling. The how is how we use this notion of sequential importance sampling to actually draw values from them, where these weights come in. And there's a beautiful story there too. Both those stories can be found in Xiao Yan's master's thesis as they apply to infectious disease models and um, in, in simulation systems. I would remind you that's posted to the Canvas site. Um, but I'd like to talk at least about that higher level. And, and once again, even with that story, what we are sampling, there's, there's a component of it that it takes, um, in, that takes some fortitude to go through extra fortitude um, because it's quite mathematically intense. I don't know if we'll, we'll get to that. We'll, we'll go through a lot of mathematically intense stuff, but there's this one component that involves a lot of applications of the probabilistic chain rule, Bayes' theorem, et cetera, and uh, Bayes' rule. We may or may not um, get to that. We'll, we'll see how the time supports this. But given that this is a fields course, um, I feel it's only appropriate we, we take some of the math seriously. We did so for Kalman filtering. And I wanna talk about how this applies to, to, to particle filtering. So here we have a state space model in general um, and uh, G are the, the governing equations behind that state space model. Let's say how quickly are state variables changing. <clears throat> and we have some process noise. And to use familiar language from Kalman filtering. <coughs> um, and uh, in general, this is going to be nonlinear. Um, and, you know, it, X, X of n, or, or X of k of n, or the change of X of k of n from time k minus one to k um, is just going to be, um, be the sum up here. So um, this should actually. Uh, be saying uh, plus plus this. So here we're we're uh, advancing advancing the model. Um, 
So uh, we're going to make uh, a simplifying assumption here, that, uh, two simplifying assumptions. Number one, measurements are, are made at regular intervals. And for simplicity, I'm going to assume that that observations, these so-called measurements, are made every unit time. So they're occurring at time k equals one, k equals two, k equals three, um, is the time at which we're making observations from the world. You can always choose your time scale if you have regularly spaced measurements so that one unit of time is the time between them. OK, um, that will simplify a lot of the notation. Um, so, so we have this, we have this state space model that we're evolving according to these, uh, to these equations here. Um, and, uh, we're going to also have a measurement model where we basically characterize, um, the, the measured data, the observed data from the world as some function of the state of the system uh, with some noise affecting the observation. And this is some general function H. Um, with Coleman filtering, there's a great hullabaloo about the form of G and G needing to be differentiable so we could take a Jacobian, et cetera. And we also had to take the Jacobian of H. We had to linearize them. Um, because common filtering is defined for linear systems. Um, it's optimal for linear systems. Um, we're free from those shackles with particle filtering, but we still conceptually have a model where, look, the observations of the world depend on the state of the system in some noisy way. Okay, fair enough. Um, so at time k, we're gonna try to estimate state x sub k um, uh, based on all the observed data to this point. So the idea is, look, at, 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 at a time of an observation, we have all the observations till then, from time one, two, three, so on, all the way up to K. And we want to use that information collectively to estimate the current state X sub K. And the N, capital N is just the number of, number of particles here, okay? Um, uh, and uh, so I, I, I note here that um, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a, excuse me, it's a vector of length then. So, so um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a vector which has n, n components in it. Okay, um, and we have m measurements. Um, okay, um, now the system is evolving um, according to a, a random process. Um, and when you have that situation where you have stochastics, there's just no way that you're going to want to try to sample trajectories of the system, what the system has done over each point in time, the true underlying state of the system from using MCMC. I mean, you've got a, a massive, dimensionality, you know, K could be in the hundreds or whatever. You're, you're not going to be sampling using MCMC to, to sample effectively from that trajectory. Um, uh, instead, what we're going to be doing is recursively try to update our estimate of X sub K from a previous estimate we had for X sub K minus one when a new observation comes in. And the idea here is very similar to Bayesian approaches in general, where we go from a prior distribution to a posterior distribution that takes into account a new observation. The prior distribution reflects our belief before that observation, and the posterior takes the new observation into account and updates our belief based on it. Um, it, it updates our belief from the prior um, in light of the observation. So that's the basic idea. Uh, we're, we have a recursive way of going from time X, sub, our, our understanding of what was the situation at X sub K minus one, at time K minus one to X sub K when a new observation comes in. 
And to do so, there's two stages we go through, prediction stage and an update stage. Um, the prediction stage um, uh, is going to basically take us uh, from the state x sub k minus one to all the way just before the next observation. If this reminds you of Coleman filtering explanation, it is with good reason, because we had a similar idea there. We have a process that's going to take us from just after the last observation, going to take us all the way to the cusp, the threshold of the new observation, just before it's taken into account. Um, it, it basically is, is going to be sampling from X sub K using all data up to, but not including Y sub K. All the data prior, strictly prior to Y sub K is taken into account in X sub K. So we haven't taken into account Y sub K yet. That's the key thing. We're, we're projecting forward the system without taking into account Y sub K but it's at the cusp of taking it into account. And then we have an update where we update that state just before the observation to, K, y, to X sub K in a way that takes this, this new observation into account. Very, very conceptually similar to what we did at Coleman filter. The new observation Y sub K allows us to update our estimate as it had been just prior to the observation to take that observation into account. Now there we did so using assumptions of Gaussian errors and, and, and with the linearization around our gases to the current point. We don't have to worry about all that stuff. We don't have to commit to being at a certain point. We're entertaining a wide variety of hypotheses about what the underlying situation is nor do we have to subject ourselves to the painful strictures associated with, um, uh, with Gaussian distribution assumptions, with normal distribution assumptions, which are binding in the, in the most heinous of ways um, in, in some epidemiological context. For example, where we have to assume negative possible cases or what have you. So between these two steps, prediction step and update step, the prediction step brings us from time X, from the state at X sub K minus one, as we estimated, to the cusp of it at K, not taking the new observation into account. And then the, up, the update, we take the new observation into account um, to get an estimate at, at, at time K um, that includes that new observation. The net effect is to go from this P sub A conditional P sub K minus one, the state at time K minus one, conditional on all the data until and including K minus one, it maps from that distribution to P sub K conditional on all observations up to and including K. So you put these two together, you compose them, and this is the mapping you get. Uh, this is what we want. This is what we want. This is what we're gonna get, okay? So we're gonna go from this to this. Now you notice that this has a inductive feel for it. We're gonna end up assuming and figuring how to do this, that we have this and figure out how to go one step further. And then we'll figure out how to go one step further. One step, ladies and gentlemen, at a time. Step by step by step so is the water jog filled. Okay, um, so, so there's gonna be this two phase, uh, and this two phase update. Now, the math is gonna come thick and fast here. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you some things to grab onto. Um, I'm gonna denote with, a, with two icons, um, uh, two quantities I want you to pay attention to. 
And not surprisingly, there are these key quantities here. Um, these quantities here, I'm going to be denoting with a star. OK, star just like that. Um, this will be a, a star that will be red, and this will be a star that's green. OK, so this is the distribution that we're going to posit we already have. It's, it's, we have in the past. We somehow managed to sample from, from the state conditional on all the data till then for that earlier point. Um, I could think we're, we started with that being given to us at the very first start, at the very start of the model, amongst other things. So this is our green star. This, by contrast, is going to be our red cross, OK? So, um, so this one here, you may recognize this. This is the state, our estimate of x sub k, the state at time k, taking into account all the data up to and including k minus 1, but not including k yet. This is, again, at the cusp of that observation. This is the cusp of the observation, just prior to the observation. We're going to denote that as this red, red cross. Okay, um, And you're going to see these symbols followed. When you see green star, think, we've got that. That's nailed. We already have that. When we see this, that's what we're going to want to get to in our prediction step. That's that's where we want to get to. That's our target. This is kind of what we have as working raw material to work with. The, the star, the green star is what we've got. We've got that in hand. We can do things with that. This is where we, we, we want to get to. OK. Um, OK, so our assumption is we've got that, and we want to figure out how to get to this. OK. OK, so, so we're going to, this is all based on Bayesian mathematics and, and, and probability theory. So if you remember your probability, if you, if you have a binary outcome, um, binary variable involved, and um, if we consider the probability of A given C, this is the probability of a and B together, given C, plus the, the probability of A and not B, given C. B is dichotomous. It's true or false. Um, and um, it's got to be either this or this. And so this just breaks up this probability of A given C into a case of A and B, and in the case of A and not B. And those are mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive. So it's plus. Um, so this is kind of a basic fact about, about probability. It's just taking this and dividing it into its two logical subpieces based on, on a, a binary variable B that can occur with A. Um, a occurs with B or A and not B, and collectively those make up A. OK. Um, now, it turns out that and this is formalized as something called the chapman kolmogorov equation. Um, this is true for continuous systems. So if you have something like this, probability of, of x sub k given y sub, um, given all the data up to k minus 1, that's the, where we want to get to here. You, you could reflect on the fact that's just the sum up by the same principle as here. It's just the sum up of a bunch of possibilities that are mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive. We can have x sub k, and I'm putting a comma to mean and here. And this is a joint um, possibility of this, x sub k and, and x sub k minus 1 for a single, a single value of it, or another possible value, or another possible value. It's got to have some value of this. And we're just totaling them up in this continuous way. And so it's an integral sign. Um, it's just like a, a lot of these pluses together with some small, small, small weighting factors here. Um, just like an integral is a bunch of is a sum up of the multi multiplications. So, so I'm asking you to trust and appealing to your intuition this Kolm, uh, Chapman Kolmogorov equation. Okay, um, this is a kind of nice factoid involving 
probability. Um, and remember, this is where we want to go to. Okay, so so we have this. Well, this is thing called the probabilistic chain rule, which may look scary, but it's actually quite beautiful. If you have probability of a b given c, it turns out that that's equal to the probability of a given b c times the probability of b given c. Now this is cool. I mean. I don't know. I, I think this is like awesome. Um, I mean, basically what you're doing is you're taking this and you're simplifying it, right? Um, so you're factoring out the B, the to get a conditional of B given C here. And then you're able to therefore move B over onto the right-hand side of that. And so you, you basically simplify, you take this and you put it into two simpler pieces, the probability of A given BC and the probability of B given C. Um, and you can actually do this many times if you have a, a, a long enough one. But in case you don't know where in the world that's coming from, this is the little derivation. I mean, this thing is just equal to that. And then you can kind of twiddle that and, and, and recognize that this is just equal to that and, and get to that directly. Um, it's all a lot of fun. Um, so, so, okay, so we have this thing and, and, and that, that forms this basic pattern. So we can rewrite it. We can take this and, and applying this basic rule, we can take this thing and stick it over there. And then we get, and that's this part of it. And then this component corresponds to uh, probability of this conditional on that. Okay, so, so this may seem like, well, thank you very much. I don't know where this is going, but yeah, I guess that's the case. Um, remember, this is where we want to get to. This is we want to get to. We're just lining things up, getting ready for the big putt. Uh, we're just lining it up. So this is 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 equal to this. Um, so th this thing here um, turns out that it's equal to the probability of of x sub k given x sub k minus one and all the data all the data up to k minus one um, uh, times um, this thing. Now, you may recognize what this thing is. And if so, you can be excused for jumping out of your seat. Um, I'd be tempted to do so myself. Um, so this is actually the thing that was given to us. This is, this is kind of what was given to us as raw materials. This is the thing that was assumed. This is we, we assumed this was available for us. And there it is, there it is. This thing we wanna to get to, it's just, we could express it as this thing times this thing we've already got. That's awesome, right? Um, this is the thing we've got in hand. That's no sweat, we're given that. We, we, know, we know we've got that, we, we, we have it already. Um, uh, now all we have to deal with is, is this, uh, mess. Yeah. Um, so, so, so what do we do? Well, we, we're, we're trying to get to, to this thing and we found we can express this thing through, through this Chapman Kolmogorov equation and so on. Um, we found in this probabilistic chain rule, we could have found, found we can, you can express it in terms of something we've got. Okay. So this is the whole idea, right? You want to, you want to build something, you want to build this, and you want to build that out of things you got. You want to build a house, you need the bricks to build the house. So, okay, there's a brick. Awesome, we got a brick here. Now we got this thing. Oh, okay. Um, okay, uh, so how, what are we gonna do with this mess? Uh, well, if you start looking at it some more, you might start to get some ideas. Um, and if you're thinking about the name of a, of a certain Markov, you, you're, 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 you're right. A first order Markov process, the idea is look, um, hey, look, um, uh, it, if all past observations um, um, before k, uh, time k minus one, we treat that as the only way they're going to influence us now is through state k, x sub k minus one. The idea is state x of k minus one took all that into account already. It already, our estimate for x of k minus one already took in all the observations before 
time k minus one. So we're kind of lugging around all these other observations, but we've already got this thing x sub k minus one that took them all into account. Why, why lug around this big bag of, of, of earlier observations prior to k minus one when, when it got something where it already took them into account? So in short, um, this thing has already take these, taken these into account. So it turns out that this is just equal to that. Okay. Um, so probability of x sub k given x sub k minus one. We don't have to worry about all these other observations because they're already packed up into our knowledge about this. This already takes all the knowledge of those already into account in its state. This is the idea of the recursive update. We've already taken them all into account in, this, in our estimate for state of x sub k minus one. So, so this whole thing here, we can boil it down to this. Oh man. So here we got this building block and here we have probability of X sub K given X sub K minus one. Um, and, and this is starting to look pretty promising. It's just saying, look, how does probability, the probability of having a certain state now given what our state was at time X sub K minus one. Um, and it turns out we're gonna be, I won't be going into it in this lecture, but we're gonna be sampling from these things. Um, the idea is we have samples from these, we can draw from it, just draw it, taking it from there. And um, turns out we can sample from this in a stochastic simulation model, whether it's an agent-based model or a compartmental model or whatever, we can, we can sample from it by simulating it forward from time k minus one to time k. Oh man, that's great. So that's our sampling. If we have this state, we can, we can simulate it forward and that's gonna give us some probability distribution for x sub k because this is a stochastic process. We're gonna, even if we have a fixed state here, we're gonna get out a probability distribution on it. Um, and this is the probability distribution conditional on having this been the case for k minus one. That would, if that was the state for k minus one. So here we've got something we could sample from. Here we've got something we can sample from. Okay, now we're cooking with gas. Um, so, so, so this is, this is nice. This is our update. We've got this way to go from here, from, uh, sorry, from here, from this thing we had earlier, that's this guy. If, if we could sample from that, if we have that, if, we, if we've got that distribution in hand, we can map it to this distribution. The, remember this distribution was the, the distribution of X sub K taking everything into account the model dynamics um, from k minus one to k and, and what we had at k minus one. Um, taking all that into account, but not yet the observation y sub k. We haven't yet taken into account the observation y sub k. This is the cusp. This is standing at the, the edge of greatness. Um, we just are missing y sub k. That's all we're missing. All we're missing. We've we've advanced ourselves. We we had everything in hand for k minus one, taking all the data up till then into account, and we've advanced ourselves all we can with the model dynamics to time k. All we're waiting for is that final observation to clench the situation, to 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 complete the situation to make us whole. Okay. Um. So we're, that was our prediction step. Okay, now we've got the update step. So we, we have this X sub K minus one, that's what we've got, that, that was this thing. Um, I should have given the notation for it on that slide. And now we wanna do this update step. We wanna update this thing at the cusp of greatness into X sub K um, in a way that considers Y sub K. So you want to take y sub k into account, update this prior distribution, which hasn't considered it, into the posterior distribution for y for x sub k. 
Okay, that's what we want to do. Um, that's what you want to do. We're, we're going to fill in the missing pieces by taking y sub k, filling it in here to get p sub k given y sub 1 to k. Okay. Um, so we're, we're through a lot of it. Got you through most of the, much of the painful stuff. I don't know most, but much of it. Um, I don't know. I think it. I don't think it's painful, but 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 you know, I recognize people differ. Okay, so at observations, the model estimates of state are going to be corrected from for empirical data, right? We're updating for this prior distribution, this belief about what things were before we saw the observation. Take into account, you know, the what we knew at what our belief was at time k minus one and then running the model forward from there okay we've got this belief just before the observation and and now we're going to take this into account the new y sub k okay okay we're going to take it to a likelihood function okay um and now <laughs> the symbols will proliferate so you'll you'll forgive me we still got our friends we got still got our old friends the red cross indicating this one the standing on the cusp of greatness. Um, maybe I should make it a red C. Um, a cusp of greatness. This is this belief about X sub K given everything we know to all the observations to K minus one and in having run it forward to time K without yet having seen Y sub K. We have this green star, which is our friend. And that was our situation in time K minus one, taking all the data up to and including time k minus one into account. Okay, um, and we're trying to get to that for k on both these instead of k minus one. That's our ultimate goal, right? Is to, to get to this from, from, from that. So this is our green star. Okay, um, great. Um, uh, so we're going to be now getting to that destination. That's the, that's the red star. This will be our red star. Okay, um, uh, the red star here. Um, we're going to be trying to map from the green star to the red star. That's our entire goal. This is green star, this is red star. Okay. Um, okay, um, so the stars are indicating, you know, the, the understanding, um, of the state, the belief of the state at that time, given all the data up to and including the time. Green is K minus one, red is K. Okay. Um, and it turns out that um, we're going to be able to, and this is where we're going, to get the distribution for this, the red star, where we're trying to get to. Maybe I should make it the gold star, where we're trying to get to, our final objective, our final final achievement um, is going to be proportional to this here, um, probability of y sub k given x sub k times this probability, this, this thing we had at the cusp of, of, of the new observation. Does anyone recognize what this is? It may be hinted to you by the fact it begins with L. It has a it has a, 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 a denotation L. Does anyone recognize what this is? The probability of observing something given the state is called a begins with an L. Likelihood function. Likelihood. This is our likelihood function. This is our likelihood. It turns out that it. It's going to be the this thing, the red star, the thing we want to get to is the is the thing we had at the cusp, um, having having advanced it times this likelihood function. Okay, this is this is really this is really cool. Um, so so here the update phase is going to map from, um, uh, it, it's going to map from this this guy uh, into to this this one here to this gal okay and um 
the detailed derivation, which I would show you if I had more time, like Fermat, um, is, um, is, is just the product of these two. Now, I have a bunch of slides that are, are quite wonderful, I, I or I, they're quite nice. Um, um, and I think they're more sound than Fermat's demonstration, but um, th th they are in um, a supplement here um, uh, that, that requires about eight extra slides. Um, uh, and maybe I will um, we'll go, go, through, <laughs> go through that, okay? Um, so uh, this is uh, this is where we're at. This is a, an audience where I think we can go through this. Um, okay, so um, uh, this is a, a detailed derivation, and I'm not going to go through it brutally slowly. But um, I'm not going to go through it with the, the enormous um, step by step uh, details. But I want to get you the gist of it. So. Um, how how did this come about? How is it that this thing we want to get to, this update, is the product of these things, and then this can be expressed in terms of 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 this uh, green star? That's what allows this whole thing to go from green star to red star, green star to red star, green star to red star. How is this that this pops out? Well, okay, it's pretty cool actually. Um, uh, the the update phase is going to be mapping this thing at the cusp of the update before, just before we have the new observation. We've run it up to time k, but we don't have the new observation yet to this thing where we have the new observation. Great. Um, and uh, I'm going to observe that this can be expressed by basic laws of probability, and this is related to Bayes' rule. Uh, like like this. I mean, if you expand out what this means, you'll find that um, this thing is equal to the joint probability of x sub k times y sub sub one to k in the numerator divided by this thing, and that 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 joint distribution p of x k y sub one to k it, it can just be expanded as this one. So this can be rewritten as this. Um, if anyone wants to talk about that in office hours, I'm glad to, to do so. But you multiply this together, you get the joint, you divide this, and you get that. Um, so it's, it's the same thing. OK. Um, so this is kind of a rewriting of what this, um, what this is and expands the top. OK. Um, now, um, here, this thing in the denominator um, uh, is, can be rewritten kind of like like this, you might say that's kind of weird, but basically we could, this is the y's from one to k, we could take y's from one to k minus one and then the jo jointly with y sub k, um, the probability of this, this is just a kind of rewriting of it in, in a more kind of explicit form, unpacking this, um, sure. Um, so, uh, and we've done so in the numerator as well. Um, so you may say, oh, there's an extra comma here. Um, so you may say, okay, yeah, um, fair enough. It's just kind of rewriting what does this mean? Um, fine. Um, uh, now, that thing in general, um, though, has, has a bunch of pieces. And we could apply that probabilistic chain rule that we saw earlier. That that is just beautiful. Um, um, this kind of recursive decomposition of this, um, uh, we could apply it to 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 this thing. So um, here uh, we're taking this uh, and we're expressing it as the product of two things: p of y sub k given x sub k. And, and then P of A given BC, we're just putting the, the Y sub K over here. That's the probabilistic chain rule you may know and love. It's just putting this over there and then taking this conditional on that. Okay, so you say, well, why is that so great? Well, does anyone recognize this? What is this? This is our friend. What is it? It's the what? It's 
It ends with a D. It starts with an L. It has a K in there. Um, oh. Likely who? <laughs> it's not likely on. This is not likely on. This is our friend. I mean, doesn't it almost smile at you? Um, this is the likelihood. Um, and okay, now we just got to deal with this. But we've been through this sort of thing before, right? I mean, okay, we got these these sort of dregs to deal with. Okay, um, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna deal with them now. Um, great. Um, so uh, here we go. Uh, this thing. Um, it, it, can be unpacked with Bayes' rule. Um, you can see why, why it takes a certain fortitude here. Um, so this thing can be unpacked with Bayes' rule. This thing will preserve. This is our friend. It's, this is the beaming phrase of our friend. It's, uh, we're not going to do anything with that. That's our friend. We like it. We're going to keep it around. Um, this thing here uh, can be expressed by Bayes' rule uh, in, in this sort of way, uh, and and so so we're gonna bring this down. This thing is equal to this. Okay, um, okay. And you may say, well, that doesn't look particularly nicer than this. Well, yeah, but look what's in the denominator. What is this thing here? Does anyone recognize it? What's what's this thing? What is that? Yeah. Likelihood. That's a likelihood <laughs> function. That's a likelihood. It's our same friend. We've got like multiple friends showing up, all smiling at us. Like this is our friend, first friend. This is the same friend, but showing up smiling at us again. And so um, we're we're really cooking with gas here. Um, um, amongst other things, these things are gonna cancel, right? I mean, that are going to, oh, sorry, sorry, wait, this is not, I'm sorry, I, I'm sorry, I, I spoke too soon. This is not, it's a close relative of our friend. It's not our friend exactly, because it is a comma here. Um, okay, they're not going to cancel quite quite yet here. Okay, um, so um, you may recall that this thing, we've just been working through this thing, we got down to this. This is very close to our friend. This is a joint. Um, uh, okay, now um, this is I've, I've just copied this um, uh, some of this from from earlier here. Um, so this thing here is is this. This is our likelihood, and then we're gonna put them together. So we had this from earlier, and we have this from this latest uh, slide, um, and we're going to to stick them together here. This earlier one was something that came from, from this. We, we had it from earlier. And we're going to, to stick them together. And we get an expression which is looking, well, here's our friend, but it's looking pretty, pretty hairy, perhaps. Um, uh, I'm tracing where things came from. You know, this one, this is our friend, he went there, and this one came down to here, etc. You're saying, okay, well, where is this all going? Where is this all going? Well, okay, so we have this. Um, so now we start to get some further structure. So, okay, if we have this, um, uh, we can separate it out into two pieces. If we have this joint distribution of y sub k and y sub k and, and all the things to y sub k minus one, we could separate a, this out in this sort of form. A, a joint distribution can always be turned into a product of a conditional and a marginal. Um, okay, um, so, so yes, that's, that's true. Now, substituting this in, uh, we we can get basically uh, we can end up uh, we can end up identifying okay um, from this we get two terms that cancel here one in the numerator uh, and one in the denominator produced by exactly this identity from here um, for for this guy here um, 
there's one in the denominator. Okay. Um, and so canceling that, now we have something a little bit simpler. Here's our friend still. The friend is, is still sticking with us. Great. And now we got this, uh, this uh, marginal distribution and we have uh, some additional terms. Okay. Okay. We're most of the way through this. Uh, I, I, the pain will end soon, <laughs> believe me. Um, okay. So we have this. Uh, great. So um, this was our likelihood. And now we're going to be able to do something pretty cool. Um, this, this one here, by also with the, pro the properties of a joint distribution, we can divide up into the product of a conditional and a marginal. OK, great. Uh, now, if we do that, we could substitute this in. Okay, now this is our, what is this? Does anyone recognize this? What is this? This is our what? Likelihood. This is our likelihood. <laughs> our likelihood there, right there. If we substituted it in. Okay, awesome. Awesome, at least someone else is excited about this. Okay, so here we have our likelihood up here. We have our likelihood down here. Um, this is cool. And look at this. Look at this. We got this thing in there. And why is that neat? Because it can do what? What can it do? It can cancel this one. Okay, because there's now one of it in the denominator or numerator. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. You know, things are just falling out of the sky. Um, it's just great. This and this um, cancel, this and this cancel. And then we have this, okay. Okay, well, our friend is not around anymore, but our friend did a valiant job. Um, our friend uh, uh, allowed us to identify some, some basic structure and simplify the situation. Okay, so, so we've got this. Okay, this is, remember, this is what we wanna get to. This is what we wanna get to, and we've got this. Okay, well, now how, how, are we gonna, how are we gonna finish this up? Well, we're almost done. We're almost done. Um, so we've got, this is the thing we want to get to. And we got that, okay. So this is the probability of y sub k given all the previous data. This is the probability of x sub k and y sub k jointly based on that. Ah, now, now something's, something may start to, to percolate. This may remind you, okay, x sub k, um, it, it, it ends up taking into account, if we take into account Markov processes, there's a lot packed up into X sub K. But before that, we're gonna, we're gonna take this and, and do a bit of manipulation. By the probabilistic chain rule, um, we can actually go simplify this thing, yeah, um, into, into this, okay? So I'm, I'm basically gonna take this thing, and we have something of this thing, of this size, of this type on the top, right up here. It's of this type. And so we could rewrite it like this, and we get this. Okay. And now another of our friends appears. Out of nowhere comes our friend, the red cross. And the red cross is X sub K on the cusp of greatness, right? It's, it's X sub K as it has been simulated up to just before, but not yet including y sub k. We haven't gone, that, that's what this is. So, okay, we have something we wanna get to. It involves our friend up to and not including the latest data point x sub k, uh, or sorry, y sub k. And then we have this thing involving, these two things involving y sub k. Okay, we're getting close. We're getting awfully close, okay. So we've got this, we got this. And now this, it's just ripe for the Markov property because this thing builds in all the data up to and including y, uh, y sub, uh, sub k minus one. Okay, um, so all observations um, is imparted uh, through their, their impacts um, uh, on the state here, uh, on this state. 
So we can write this here uh, as, as simply this likelihood. This is, what's the likelihood of observing y sub k, that observation in light of x sub k and all previous observations? Well, it's just its likelihood of observing it based on x sub k. X sub k incorporates all those previous observations. All these previous ones are already incorporated. Ooh. Mm. Those are already incorporated. So, so this is just, what is this? This is our what? What likelihood. is this? It's our likelihood. likelihood. It's our likelihood. It's our friend. We've got our two friends. This slide is just full of friends, right? And this is where we're trying to get to. This is the friend whose house we're trying to reach. Okay. So this thing is the likelihood of observing y sub k given x sub k. Okay. Um, so now we have this thing we want to get to is our, oh my gosh, it's like the product of two friends. This is great. Let's bring these two friends together. It's the likelihood times this thing on the cusp of the observation divided by this, divided by this thing. Now, does anyone notice something about this? This is the probability of getting observation y sub k conditional on observations one through k minus one. What is not present in this expression? Okay, that's a pretty dangerous question for me to ask. Um, what, what does this not depend on? It doesn't depend on X. It does not depend on X at all. It's, it's purely a function of, 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 of Y's. And so if we want to sample from values of X, turns out we don't have to calculate this. We don't have to worry about this. It's just some constant. We don't need to know what it is. It's, it's, we, if we could sample from this, we don't need to know what this, this thing is. Much as in MCMC, we didn't know, need to know there was another constant there that we didn't need to know um, in computing the value of the ratio of the posteriors. We don't need to know this. This is just some, some constant. We don't need to know it. Um, so we're going to be able to sample from this using samples from this together with samples from this likelihood by, by excuse me, by, by um, computing the value of the likelihood of observing for a given K, um, for, for a given particle state at time K, observing the observed data Y. Um, this is, this allows us to compute something proportional to this probability, to this probability of, of, of observing, uh, excuse me, of, of, of having X sub K given, given all the, the Y sub Ks. So it turns out this will allow us to sample from X sub K to draw values of the latent state at time K Without, we don't have to worry about this thing. This is just some normalizing constant. Um, it doesn't depend on, on, on uh, X sub K. Um, so we're gonna be able to draw values from it without worrying about it. Um, using just, just what we've got just before the update. This is what happened when we, we started at time X sub K minus one with samples there. We run them forward to time k, but we don't yet have the new observation. Those are all samples there uh, from that. And we're gonna be able to compute the likelihood function for those samples, for each of those samples. And it turns out we'll be multiplying the weights times them. Okay, so, so that was the, the extra fortitude that was required. Um, congratulations, you folks have slogged through, are now veterans of going through the most detailed derivation of this that I've given in years. Um, now, it turns out 
there's something really cool that comes out of this. And I'm going to try to avoid brutalizing you with this, but uh, with, with the detailed math. But it, it turns out that, that having obtained that, um, it turns out we can take it a little bit further yet. Okay. Um, uh, we can, by, by considering, considering uh, this relationship, we can also derive a relationship for considering uh, the relationship between whole trajectories of the state of how the system actually moved over successive observation points in light of data over time. Um, uh, and we can actually have a way of sampling from the trajectories that's similarly simple, okay? Um, so in short, this same process allows us to sample from trajectories over time. The particle filtering can give us, to be sure, uh, a cross-sectional view at any one time. It can give us, for any given point in time here, how many people were susceptible, you know, distribution, a joint distribution over the number of susceptibles exposed, infectives, recovered. Um, joint distribution because each sample has a certain value for EI, EI, EIR, uh, SEIR. Um, and it's a joint distribution. Um, those that have more susceptibles might have more exposed as well and fewer recovered, et cetera. Um, okay. Uh, but um, that's a cross-sectional view. It turns out with this latest thing is saying is we can sample from trajectories. We can actually sample from the particle filter what was happening at this time, this time, this time, and this time for a certain lineage, a certain trajectory over time. Um, in other words, we can have um, a longitudinal history sampled of this is a plausible way things uh, evolve. These are sequences over time. Just like with hidden Markov models, with the Viterbi algorithm, for example, we could arrive at the single most likely sequence. Here we can sample from different sequences over time, sequences of latent states as they applied over time. Each of them tells a story tells a narrative of what happened over time that's plausible, a plausible narrative for what was going on in system state at time one, time two, time three, time four. And those narratives might be different. Um, the cross-sectional summary is giving you at any one point kind of a, a cross-section of those narratives, but the narratives themselves may tell a story that is much more nuanced. For example, a cross section may just tell you, oh, at this time we weren't sure if you know it was high or low. This other time uh, we weren't sure if it was high or low. This other time every things were all in close agreement. This other time, once again, there was a big disparity. What it doesn't tell you, a cross sectional one, is is it the same particles that that were assuming it to be high, 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 and then the same, and then high. Um, and others low, 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 or were they moving between them in their interpretation? Um, a given narrative may only, uh, uh, may, is, is positing a certain sequence over time of what happened that's only roughly summarized by the cross-sectional one. Narratives are much richer yet because they give you potential histories of what has happened over time that are consistent, that logically hang together, um, that, that are at once true to the empirical evidence and to the rules of how infection develops in the system. So particle filtering, it turns out, 
the same basic mechanisms allow us to sample from trajectories. And in order to do that, there's a little bit more mechanism. Um, I'll see if I can share with you a model that does it, but it allows you to backcast what was going on at earlier times, as well as understanding what's going on now, now casting and forecasting. It allows us to backcast what was the case at earlier times and allows you to sort of forensically identify what was the case. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, this was the fourth level of particle filtering you've just heard about. I know that it was mathematically intensive. I know that it, uh, it, it probably required some fortitude from you, um, but uh, it's good to know that this is all based on principled Bayesian mathematics. It all hangs together. The reason we have the likelihood function, we multiply it by the weights, can be traced back in part to those equations we saw there. The fact that it's recursive, that we could take a sample now at time k minus one, that, that um, green star, and turn it into a, uh, a sample at the cusp of the new observation, that red cross, and then take that new observation into account with the likelihood function and turn it into a sample at time k minus, at time k that takes and cut the latest data and all the earlier data that comes out of those equations. Now, next time, I'm going to have a hard choice because we could go one level down further and we could talk about important sampling, how we actually sample those distributions. I flashed in front of you description of these different distributions. Um, and I sort of alluded to the fact we could sample from them, but I didn't really show you how we sample from them, which was after all at the heart of like MCMC was a clever way to sample things. And there's a clever way here. It's called sequential importance sampling based on these weights. And it's a neat way to sample from it. Um, uh, but it would require some additional fortitude um, uh, for, for seeing, ah, why does it all work out? And what is the condensation algorithm uh, where we just use the likelihood um, offer a particular simple, although um, sometimes uh, regrettably simple, uh, simplistic sort of uh, accounting for the situation. So we may go into that. Um, uh, I'm gonna go through and, and look at my notes there. The other thing I, I really want to get onto is PMCMC. Um, and that too requires some understanding. If you understand particle filtering at a basic level, you have a good understanding of its intuitions and you have an understanding of MCMC, particle MCMC, while it's more, much more sophisticated than ether, will flow out of it. But I wanna be able to capture that um, and capture it well. Um, and I may also talk about some, um, some tips when using particle filtering well. Um, anyway, I'm gonna consider these for next time, uh, but I hope uh, that this is helpful in terms of some of your understanding of particle filtering. Okay, um, so that's all we have time for today. Um, and I will welcome uh, students in office hours uh, after, uh, five minute break. So thank you very much. Take care. Oh, I see all the likelihood. Yes, likelihood indeed, L. Um, thank you uh, for, for um, putting those forward. That's exactly right. Okay, so I'll be back in five minutes if anyone would like to chat.